Kiri stumbles through her room and clumsily falls on her bed. A soft towel wrapped around her, and one of her legs already part way through her lower coverings. Her ears are all pointed up straight and she is softly trilling to herself. She is excited. After all, why shouldn't she be? Just a few minutes ago, Krogonar woke her, telling her that she has apparently slept in, and Kir's son has something he wants to tell her about the strange newcomer. She can't wait to hear what exactly he has in store for her. And that's the reason why she is hurrying that much right now, hastily putting on her coverings and drying off her freshly cleaned fur with record-breaking speed. As she is done with getting her light coverings on, she eagerly grabs her comm unit from her nightstand, stopping briefly as her paw hovers next to the pouch she was gifted yesterday, a bittersweet feeling weighing on her. Her brief stare at the old man's was genuinely pleasant, even considering the circumstances, but it also symbolises a few things she doesn't really want to think about. Things from back home. She exhales deeply and drops her thought, not wanting to go there this early in the day. With a soft smile, she turns her attention away from the ornate bag and tucks her clunky communicator into its usual pouch. But she really should visit Kurzweil again at some point and repay his kindness. She makes a mental note to do so one day. As she gets up from her bed, she instinctively reaches for her cloak, which usually lies on her drawer, but her paw runs across the empty space, finding nothing. Huh? She could swear she put it there yesterday. Maybe Dushavi hid it again from her. Not worrying too much about it, she eagerly hurries out of her room and down to the kitchen. Shortly after, a tossle looking but slightly damp Kiri rushes into the kitchen, wearing most of her light coverings as her fur still has that signature spiky look of not being properly dried in some spots. You have some news for me? She bursts in, not even fully through the door yet. Startled by her sudden and quick entrance, Kirzan lets out a yelp and almost throws his drinking bowl at the wall, earning a entertained laugh from Dushavi sitting next to him. Void, what's gotten into you? He exclaims, embarrassed by his instincts taken over that easily. He calmly sets his bowl down on the table in front of him, as he smooths over his raised fur with his upper pair of paws, glaring at Kiri. Sorry? She shrugs. Dusha V seems to thoroughly enjoy the display, her hissing and clicking equivalent of laughing only getting more hysterical. He turns to the large reptilian next to him. Oh, get a hold of yourself, he growls. It takes Dusha V a few seconds until she manages to stop. Wonderful, set up, the execution, perfect. Should have seen your face, she barks out, blinking tears away. Set up? What do you mean? Krogonar interjects, speaking up for the first time. You know, might have been aiming for this kind of entrance when I told your doctor something to tell her, she admits to Krogonar. But what the void happened to you, Kiri? Do you run into another gang of apex idiots on your way here? You're looking worse than yesterday. She semi-seriously scolds her, cleverly trying to steer the conversation away from that topic. Huh? What do you mean? A bit confused, she looks down at herself, wondering what exactly the reptilian meant. Oh, she thinks out loud. Yeah, oh. She put her coverings on backwards. That's why it feels so awkward around there, she thinks aloud, tugging at her torso coverings. Seriously, a fine young woman such as yourself ought to take care of her appearance, the reptilian emphasises. At the mention of her age and appearance, Kiri's facial expression hardens, and her demeanour becomes a little aggressive. I don't really care about that particular topic, Kiri growls as she looks at the floor, her tone making it clear that she doesn't want to discuss the subject anymore. Cursed. Kroganar, who is currently sitting across the table from Dusha V, gives a sharp hiss, and Dusha V stops talking, going back to sipping at her bowl, now leading a wordless conversation with the other Rao Kier through looks and expressions alone. By the looks of it, he is scolding her again about something. Kiri still hasn't understood Rao Kier and facial expressions perfectly, so it could be something else entirely instead. But well, she doesn't really care to be honest. If it were important, they would talk properly so that everyone present could hear them. She has more pressing matters than Dushavi's usual stupid shenanigans anyways, so she decides to just ask Krogner about it later. Maybe. What about the stranger though? She excitedly asks, facing Kirsan. That part was true, right? You still haven't told me. Kirsan sighs for a moment before he lets up. We're going to have a talk later. He not so silently whispers to the prankster, before he turns away to face Kiri. Let us go to the guest room then. 
Dushevi helped me take our newcomer there yesterday, Kersan suggests, shooting a brief glare at the mentioned reptilian, emphasizing her name ominously. Yes, Kari replies excitedly, almost jumping in place as her whiskers go wild. Kersan utters something she can't make out under his breath, shaking his head with a faint smirk on his lips. Well, let's go then, walk and talk, he says. Hmm? She eagerly nods. The two leave the kitchen behind, Kiri adjusting her clothing as they walk, Dushavi whispering something to Krogonar that she can't quite make out. So, do you remember what I told all of you about that newcomer of ours yesterday? Kizan asks her, looking back over his shoulder at her. Sure, um, they are injured and were poisoned by vent horrors. He makes a hard to place noise. Oh, and they are malnourished, she quickly adds. Close enough. He eyes Kiri curiously, thinking about something. We are going to have a little chat about your usage of a restricted stimulant later. I found out this morning, by the way. Krogonar approached me and told me how worried he was about you, telling me that you had been up for more than two full cycles and a bit... off. Irritable would be an expression. She doesn't answer and makes a face, caught off guard and already dreading that particular conversation. Anyways, he breaks the silence after a few moments. As I said before, while you were sleeping, Dushavi transferred them to me while I was doing some more research of sorts. Research? She can't remember the last time Kirsan would have done something like that. He seems to catch her curious expression and starts gesticulating with his lower arms, emphasizing his words and visualizing the concepts he is talking about. I was taking a better look at the images of their broken arm and I made a very interesting discovery. Their musculature is vastly different from ours. If I read correctly, then that kind of muscle should only be able to contract and expand on a single axis. Completely different from ours. Okay? She grimaces, not getting the point yet. Well, let me put it that way. They are probably a lot stronger than what you would think them to be. And I want you to be careful around them. Not that careful, mind you. You don't have to stay away from them or something like that. But the last thing I need right now is for someone else to get hurt. You understand? He stops and turns around, looking her in the eyes. All right, shouldn't be no problem, she answers non-committally. Good, he nods, continuing to walk in front of her. By the way, what makes you so excited to see them? He inquires casually. I get that meeting someone new, in almost every sense of the word, can be exciting, but you seem to be a bit... extra today, he asks, genuinely interested. She grimaces, struggling to find an answer that she could tell him. Or rather an answer that she feels comfortable telling him. Nothing in particular, she tries to downplay. He catches on to her lie, but decides not to press her any further. If you say so, he replies, sounding somewhat disappointed. Too bad for him, there is no way in the void that she would voluntarily tell anyone her actual reason right now. Thankfully, the uncomfortable silence lasts only a few moments. As they reach the door to the newcomer's room and Kirsan stops in front of the door, Turning to face Kiri again. There is one more thing I want to tell you before you enter. Okay? Kirsan clicks his tongue and runs a paw over his left main ear, a nervous tick on his part. He then gestures towards the door. They are no longer my concern, he begins, pointing at the door, but yours. I own a vet clinic, not a hospital, that you can just dump random strangers in. I take care of beasts and animals, not people. This catches her a bit by surprise, but she already figured that it would come to this sooner or later. Kersan spreads his arms out, gesturing around them. It is quite easy for all of this to turn into some kind of back alley chop shop for all kinds of unsavory types, and I've worked too hard for that to happen. She avoids eye contact and lowers her ears. Sorry, I didn't mean to take advantage of you, she mumbles apologetically. His expression turns a bit softer and he starts speaking with a warmer voice again. Ah, it seems my wedding was poor. You don't have to apologise. I actually agree with your decision, to be honest. You made the right call. Are you sure? She asks, doubting his sudden change of direction. Absolutely. As you've said yourself, a regular hospital would have had no idea how to treat them. You might have saved their life with your quick thinking. He praises her. Still, I want you to internalise that even if you make the right decision, there can be undesirable consequences. As a potential future captain of your own starship, you better learn those kinds of lessons before shit hits the fan. And what better method of learning something is there than experiencing something firsthand? He winks at her. You give me too much credit, she replies with a weird undertone, and dismisses his hint with a flick of her ear. 
Kazan starts nervously fumbling again as that uncomfortable silence sets in again. About the cost of their treatment, he begins, struggling to continue their conversation. Me and Krog and I have already talked it out. You don't have to worry about the money. All you have to worry about for now is taking care of our guest. For real? She asks. A weight off her shoulders. Yes, for real. The Code of Honor even demands it. Besides, this room has not been used for a while anyways, and to be honest with you, I might also be a bit excited about our guest. He sheepishly admits. You see, their very existence goes against several leading theories in the fields of sapient biology, society and evolution. Void be damned, they are a living paradox. There may be several non-intelligent species with similar building blocks, so to speak, but they are often completely different from them in pretty much every other aspect, and they each share only one of their traits. Wow, that's... weird. Indeed. Do you remember me mentioning those linear muscles earlier? A perfect example of what I am talking about, because, in fact, you have already encountered a species with the same kind of musculature yourself. Oh, really? Images of the many strange and sometimes downright creepy creatures she has seen during her long, long stay on this station flicker in front of her inner eye. Which one? she asks. Their companion, he answers with a hint of pride. No, that can't be right. How in the world would that kind of monstrosity show its physiology with such a helpless and fragile looking being? Blood beasts? Are you for real? He simply nods. That can't be right. You've got to be kidding me right now. No, I am absolutely serious. As funny a coincidence it might be, they actually share part of their physiology with each other. Stars? But how? Blood beasts are completely different. They are wild and dangerous monsters that kill anything on sight. Why would a thinking sapien share something with that kind of creature? Kazan takes a while to answer, frowning. Well, Kiri, evolution is a wild and chaotic thing. There are almost infinite reasons why they would turn out this way. Maybe they hail from a high gravity world, or perhaps they had to fight off strong predators in their past. Did they use their strength to crack hard shells of fruit? All we know for sure is that we are who we are, and they are who they are. Almost no one can influence their own evolution. He quickly adds, muttering under his breath. Huh? What was that last part? Ah, nothing. Forget about it. It is Mrs. Sir. Some things you are better off not knowing. His gaze grows distant for a bit before he shakes himself out of it. Much to Kiri's concern. She has never seen him like that before. Right, the room. His demeanor back to his typical jovial professionalism. I have told you all you need to know for now. The rest is up to you. Remember to check in on them regularly and immediately report to either Dushevi or me if they start causing you trouble. She stares at him, still concerned about his... episode just now. Do you understand? He asks her, leaning in and giving her a serious look. Oh, yeah, sure. Remember to check in and tell you when they start going crazy, she repeats. Good. He checks his personal comm unit, frowning at it. Well, I might have been in the middle of my morning break, but it seems I have to get back to work now. A half-starved Dormavi is quite a pain to take care of, after all. So... He holds one of his lower paws up. Don't be. I chose this profession. Mission the break or two is something I am quite used to. Good luck with your own charge. And please, try not to label their companion as some kind of mindless monster. They might be called blood beasts, but they are actually quite smart and show signs of possessing emotions. Those two even seem to be bonded somehow. You won't have to worry about being attacked, as long as you don't give them a reason to. Uh, sure, she eagerly nods. The male Caron walks away, leaving Karee standing in front of the metal door. As long as I don't give them a reason to, huh? Well... Karee grabs the doorknob and carefully peeks through, doing her best to make as little noise as possible, as she pokes her snout inside to see. <laughs>